wake up! Now that I have your attention, it's time for a pop quiz. What was last week's sermon about? You're excused if maybe you weren't here. Or at least, what was last week's Sunday? It was a special Sunday of the church year. What was it? Now, my point is not to make you feel guilty about not remembering last week's theme or last week's sermon. Sometimes I don't remember the sermon from the week before because you've got to get that sermon out to put the new sermon in. But last week it was All Saints Day, and we talked about heaven. We talked about how we are God's saints. He makes us his children. He puts his name on us. He washes our sins away in baptism. In the second service, we even had a a baptism last week. But the point isn't to make you feel guilty about all that. My question really is, how long did it take once you were out the doors and in your car to lose your focus? After all, last week we talked about heaven and we heard in Revelation 7 all about the wonderful things that are going to be there for us. No more hunger. No more thirst. And even in Texas, where we live now, right? We know the scorching heat. No more scorching heat in heaven. God will wipe every tear from our eyes which I think is one of the most ironic statements in the Bible because how can you not have tears in your eyes as you listen to it? And yet, even with this beautiful picture of heaven, and I know many of you were longing to see it as we talked about it. All the joy, your struggles gone, no more pain, reunited with your loved ones, It probably didn't take very long before going back out into the world, everything rushed over you again, and you kind of lost your focus. Today, the Apostle Paul is going to encourage us to stay awake, to be alert and sober, to keep watch for Jesus' return. The reason that we do so is because we are different from the rest of the world. And I know we don't want, often don't like to talk that way. We don't want Christians to be all that different from the rest of the world. But the truth is the Bible says that we are different. And in this case, we are different in recognizing that Jesus is going to return. Paul writes to the Thessalonians here, but he's also writing to us. And he tells us, you know very well that the Lord will return. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. He's repeating Jesus' own words from Matthew 24. You know how a thief works. The thief does not come up to the homeowner and say, okay, I'm going to be coming to your house. What day works for you and what time? He doesn't even tell the homeowner that he's coming. He depends on surprise. He's hoping that the homeowner will be caught unaware, or even not be home so that he can go into the house and take all that he wants, everything that he can carry. This is how the day of the Lord will come, like a thief in the night. People will be saying, peace and safety. And now maybe you're thinking, well, that means Jesus can't return today because who around these parts or anywhere in the world is saying peace and safety? You look at the world and you see the wars that are going on. The illness, the problems, the natural disasters. Who is saying peace and safety these days? But Paul is talking about a specific kind of peace and safety. He's talking about a peace and safety before God that they're claiming. And not in the sense that Christians would claim it, peace and safety through Jesus, but Simply a peace and safety that exists because if God even exists at all, he's certainly not going to come in judgment on this world. And so it doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what you believe, 
He's not coming. Paul says that as people are proclaiming this peace and safety, the Lord will return. He will return to judge the living and the dead. It will come like a thief in the night. It will come like labor pains on a pregnant woman. Now, I don't know very much about that, so I had to focus group it. And I asked the ladies at our Power Hour Bible study, who are all moms, so they know, what it's like when labor pains come on you. And they said, one of the main things is, you ask the question, is this really happening? Because as a pregnant lady, you have been undergoing all kinds of aches and pains, something new every single day for the last nine months. You may have even experienced Braxton Hicks contractions, which are false contractions, false labor. And so when the real labor pains come, you ask, is this really happening? The same with our Lord's return. Many will say, is this really happening? Is this really the end? And there will be no escape. But we're different. Paul says that we are not in darkness. Instead, we are children of light, children of the day. And we know that our Lord will return. As we confess, he will come to judge the living and the dead. And so we're not like those who are in the darkness who sleep. A person who sleeps is not aware of what's going on around them. They're only aware of the dreams inside their head, but not on what's going on in their house or around their house or anywhere in the world. They're asleep. The person living at night gets drunk. Now, Paul's not just talking about literal consumption of alcohol here. He's using it as a picture. And the picture is that a person who gets drunk, their senses are dulled to what's going on. Though they are conscious somewhat, they are mostly unaware of their surroundings and mostly unaware of what's going on. So are the people who live in the night. Paul's encouraging us by reminding us that we are not children of the night, we are children of the light, we are children of the day, not of the darkness. But at the same time, he encourages us to be alert and sober. In fact, you could say, translate those words as be self-controlled and alert. And maybe that sounds like another familiar Bible passage that the Apostle Peter wrote in his first letter. Be self-controlled and alert Because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Even as we're trying to keep watch for our Lord Jesus, our enemy, the devil, he wants us to fall back to sleep or to get drunk. Why do people get drunk? Often they get drunk because it relieves stress. Or it reduces anxiety. Or it makes them feel good when life makes them feel bad. And Christians are not immune to these things in the face of the Lord's return. Because he is going to return to judge the living and the dead, and you look at that statement and you think, well, if he's going to judge me on the basis of what I've done with my life, It's going to be real hard for him to come up with a verdict in my favor. And the devil uses this to lead us to want to get drunk. So what is your drink of choice? Perhaps it is literal alcohol or drugs, things that dull the senses to the pain and the anxiety. Maybe it's the drink of sex or pornography. It's the drink of the pursuit of fame and fortune, because if you just amass enough wealth, then you can solve all your problems and the end will not come for you. Maybe it's the drink of family, 
because as long as you invest enough in your family, then they will grow up and they will be successful and you will leave a legacy. The end will not come for you even after your death. Maybe it's the drink of work. That there's so much going on around me, but when I'm at work, I can just zero in on this and forget everything around me. Sorry, honey. Sorry, Jesus. I've got to work. Maybe it's the drink of hate and resentment. That the world is just falling apart and people don't act the way you want them to. Your personalities don't mix. And so if you fill yourself up with hate, at least you can give an excuse for why it's all going south. Maybe it's the drink of an obsession with politics. If the right person doesn't win in 2024, then the world is going to come to an end. Right? And we allow ourselves to drink deeply of these drinks and get distracted from the fact that our Lord will return. But Paul says we are children of the light. We know that he's going to return. He's going to come to judge the living and the dead. So we have two problems to solve. First, our fear of his judgment. And second, our struggle to remain alert and awake and self-controlled and alert. He says he's coming to judge the living and the dead. But we're not in the darkness. Not only do we know that he's coming, but we know what the verdict will be when he comes to judge the world. We know what his judgment on his believers will be. Like Paul says, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. You see, the, the sentence, the judgment, was actually passed a long time ago at Jesus' first coming. He came and was born of the Virgin Mary. He was placed in a manger. He grew up and lived perfectly, making none of the mistakes that you and I make on a daily basis. And he died. He died on the cross so that we might live with him. And his death does, isn't dependent on our watchfulness, whether we are awake or asleep. He died because he wanted to save us. What a shame it would be if we were not waiting for him to return. His death would count for nothing. But this is the point, that he is coming to judge us. But when he comes and judges us because of the faith that the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts, he will vindicate us. We will be declared not guilty. Because 2,000 years ago, he said, it is finished. And so the judgment of Jesus is nothing to fear for us who are in the light. Children of the light, children of the day. Because Jesus is coming to judge us not guilty. To declare publicly to the world, a world that does not recognize us, that we are his. And that we are going with him to heaven. When he comes to judge the living and the dead, he will raise our bodies from the grave if we have already died, reunite us with our souls and bring us to be in heaven, just as we talked about last week, all those wonderful joys that we can expect. And so his return is nothing to fear. He gives us then additional defense against fear and against falling asleep. He gives us the breastplate of faith 
and love, a breastplate which covers this part of the body, right? A faith, trust in him that he is our savior, that when he returns it is not for our condemnation but our, for our redemption. And this faith paired with love because faith produces love to serve God, to serve our neighbor, to root out all the hate, all the resentment, to put into proper focus those things that we make the obsession of our lives, serving our family to God's glory, working for the honor of God, even voting to serve him and to serve others. We live like Jesus is going to come back. That he is going to return. This has happened to me a couple times. I'll have a meeting here till around 8 or 8.30. And then you know after the meeting there's always an after meeting and then an after after meeting. And so then I finally get home and I walk into my house, go into my bedroom and there Nicholas is sleeping on my side of the bed, of course. And Caitlin will tell me, well, he was, he was waiting for you, but he fell asleep. It's hard to wait. It's hard to stay watchful. Not only does the world crash around us with its problems, but the devil is also trying to get us to fall asleep. Our own weaknesses don't help either. But Jesus has made you a child of the light. You are no longer a child of the darkness. You are no longer a child of the night, but of the day. And so you can walk in the light as he is in the light. You can live like he's going to come back, and when he comes back, it won't be the end. but just the next chapter of eternal life. Amen.